just making sure. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll get we'll uh, jump right in. Father God, thank you for this morning, God. We are honored uh, to be here. We thank you for your word that is going to go forth this morning, God. We receive your word with meekness, and we thank you for gracing us to apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus. Amen. 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 You know, I was talking to my wife, um, I think it was just yesterday, actually, when we were talking about this. And I told her, I said, you know, the problem with a lot of Christians and why the word of God is not changing their life, uh, it might be giving them a little boost, you know, uh, but it's not changing their life. It's because we view the Bible more as a motivational book than we do as uh, words of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. How many of you know that the word of God is not just some motivational book? That's right. Amen. Amen. I mean, it can motivate you and it should motivate you. But they have, Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're life. Yeah. Hallelujah. So start thinking of God's word that way more. And I guarantee you his word will actually start changing your life. Right. Praise the Lord. Okay. Follow the yellow brick road. So let's go over here to Matthew chapter 8. And verse 18, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 18, and Jesus is going to give us a lesson here, a very important lesson that we need to hold dear. Okay, Matthew 8, 18, and when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. How many of y'all have made that commitment in your heart? Jesus, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Amen. I am completely committed to you. And Jesus is pretty much, his response to them is, are you sure? Because I don't have a home. Amen. Sometimes it's going to get a little bit rough, right? Um... Verse, uh, verse 21, then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Amen. You know, the truth of the matter is we can get so caught up in this world that we forget where our home is. We forget where our home is. And that's exactly what Jesus is reminding them right here. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 through 10. I don't want to read it up here, actually. Hebrews 11. 8 through 10. It's okay. There we go. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. How many of y'all go somewhere not knowing where you're going? No. When you leave, you know where you're going. Right? When God called, when God called Abraham out, he didn't know where he was going. What do you call that? Faith. You know, we live in, in a society that is so mentally driven with knowledge and facts and information. And I'll tell you, you're going to have a really tough time serving God and stepping out in faith, living that way. Amen. You, you got to have some faith. You got to be able to step out into the unknown, not having everything planned out. Now, obviously, Wisdom is a good thing, and wisdom plans for the future. It's good to have a plan in place, but brothers and sisters, we cannot guess the plan of God in a million years. And you know what? You're never going to guess everything that the next step entails that God has for you. You're going to just have to take that step of faith, not really knowing sometimes what's going to happen. Amen? Um, so we went out, not where going, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And verse 10 here, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now let's get down to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And surely if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 
You know, in this life, sometimes you're going to feel a little bit lost in this world. In this world, you're going to feel like you don't really belong. But that's okay because your home is that which is not seen as God is trying to speak to Abraham. And if we would be more concerned about where our home is up there, then we wouldn't be so concerned about the world and its minute details down here. Amen. Amen? So I'm not saying that, you know, we should just forget about everything in this world and forsake everything in this world and just look up to heaven because God is calling us to bear fruit in this life. Amen? And to be effective in this life. But at the same time, we must forget where our home is. And you'll notice here how God called Abraham out from his father's house, out from his father's land. And, the, and I wrote down here, God has to empty us of the world's desires just so he can fill us with his desires. Sometimes God has to lead you down a path that might be a little bit lonely for a time, that might, you know, you'll, be, you'll be separated for a time just so he can empty you of, of those worldly desires. And so he can fill you with his own. Because I'll tell you, if Abraham had never left his father's land, his father's house, he would have never received the vision that God had, would soon give him um, that he would be the father of many nations. God had to empty Abraham of what was so he can begin to show him and fill him with what is going to be. Amen? And I'll tell you, you know, we live in a really small town, Lockhart. There's a lot of really small towns around here. But I want to challenge you never ever to think small about God. Amen. Because the thing about small towns is, and I'm not bashing small towns, but the thing about small towns is the people in them think, tend to think small. They tend to think small about themselves. They tend to think small about God. And they tend to think small about what God can do through them. They're like, no, I'm just going to raise my little family in a little shack here in the corner. And, you know, we're just going to serve Jesus all the days of our life. And you know, and that's fine, and that's great. But let me tell you, what if God has more for you, though? Amen. Amen? Amen. Maybe God's plan is for you just to, you know, grow up here in Lockhart and to raise a family and, and to serve Jesus faithfully all the days of your life and, and be an influence here, right? But what if God is calling you to go out? What if God is calling you to go out and to, and to grow? Amen? What if he's calling you to go out and to do, you know, go to the mission field or something? I'm just saying, don't limit God. Let God empty you of your desires in this life so he can fill you with his desires and lead you into his purpose and calling for you. Amen. Just like he did with Abraham. Uh, let's go over here to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And verse 11 here is key. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. See, there's that word again, pilgrims. We have to start thinking of ourselves this way. We are the children of God. You know, when Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, he could have called angels to come down and take him off that cross. But you know why he stayed up there? Because this world is not his kingdom. Amen? Amen? Amen. His, his kingdom is in, a, is in another life, in another place. Beloved, I beg you to sojourners and pilgrims and stand from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Um, yeah. You know, the nation of Israel, when God had separated them and, and called them apart, he, he really called them to be his own special holy nation that upheld his values, that upheld his laws, that served God faithfully with a, you know, a whole heart. And the reason why God did that was because God was trying to use Israel as an example for other nations. God was, his, his original, his, his intent was that Israel would be faithful to him and that their prosperity would go unrivaled. And that other nations would see the prosperity of Israel and the good things going on in Israel. And that they would see the God that Israel serves and they would choose to embrace the one true God, the God of Israel. That was God's intent. That's why he called Israel to be a part, to be separate. And I'm telling you, 
that God is calling us to be set apart from this world. Why is he calling us to be set apart from this world? Not because he's trying to, you know, take away our fun, which let me tell you, sin is fun for a season, but in t there comes a time when you got to pay up. And you know what the price is for sin? It's death. Yes. And no one wants to pay that. Amen? Sin will kill you physically, um, it, but it'll also kill you emotionally. Sin will kill you in multiple ways. It'll kill your friendships. It'll kill your job. It'll, it'll kill your, your marriage. It'll kill um, your relationship with your kids. It'll kill, uh, I don't know, everything. <laughs> everything in its path. That's just how sin is. It kills. But thank God for the grace of God that was sown in us. Amen. Amen. And that's the one thing that sin can't kill is the grace of God. The one thing that sin can't overcome is God's grace. See, sin can overcome the will to live right. Do you hear me? Sin can, if you, I'm going to live righteously, I'm going to do this and do that. Sin will overcome you and overtake you. But the one thing that sin cannot defeat is grace. Amen? Amen. Thank God for that grace. And God in his grace is calling us to be separate, to be set apart. Like we read there in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 11. He says, be different. Because this world is not your home. I'm calling you to be separate. I'm, I'm calling you to not have sex before marriage. Amen. I'm calling you to live holy lives. Mm -hmm. I'm calling you to be honest and be truthful. I'm calling you to treat everyone uh, according to not how they look on the outside, but to treat everyone equally, fairly, the same. See, this is what it means to be set apart. To be set apart doesn't mean that you come to church and say, Hallelujah, Jesus. What is your life like? God's calling us to be set apart because this, this world is not our home. We're not supposed to be like the people in this world. Amen? We're not. We're not supposed to have that much in common with this world. Praise the Lord. And, and there's a reason because God wants us to separate ourselves so he can show his glory through us. Because he wants to bless you and he wants to prosper you. And he wants to, to raise you up. But first you've got to humble yourself. And you've got to let God drain you of your, your worldly desires. So he can fill you with his desires. With his kingdom. And he can raise you up and use you for his glory and honor and praise. Amen. Amen? Praise God. We must not forget where our home is. Um, <laughs> let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 15. The world ought to feel weird to us. The world ought to feel strange to us. Abraham left to go into a strange land. The Bible refers to us as sojourners, as pilgrims. As Christians, we should not get too comfortable in this life. It's good to have nice cars. It's good to have a nice house. It's, it's, it's good to have these material things, but don't get comfortable. Don't get comfortable. Because soon those, those things, they're worth nothing. When, it, when you compare the things of this world that are temporary with the things of God, the kingdom of God, it's, they're really worth nothing. Amen? The world ought to feel weird to us. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians it says, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Amen? Now, when I talk about being separate as a believer, I'm not saying, you know, anytime you see a sinner walking down the street, you have to cross over to the other side of the street, like, oh, I can't get near them. Their unholiness might get on me. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'll just say, if, if you think that way, then you just need a revelation of grace, because like I said... Grace is the one thing that sin can't defeat. And if you were living and walking in God in the grace of God, sin would not uh, scare you. Amen? Unholiness wouldn't, wouldn't scare you. Amen. See, Jesus wasn't afraid to get down and dirty in a sinner's life. He wasn't afraid to commune with sinners. He's like, oh, oh, they, they, might, they might taint my holiness. Jesus didn't think like that. No, he got in there. Amen? 
But the grace of God is what affected the other person. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We need to be strong in the grace of God. Hallelujah. So what part is believe with an unbeliever? But I will say this as well. There are some Christians who are very carnal. And listen, they use um, with, where Jesus spent time with sinners. They use that as an excuse to be worldly. There are Christians who do that. They say, well, Jesus spent time with sinners too. And really what it is, is you just want to be worldly. Amen. Instead of being set apart. So, in other words, it goes both ways. <laughs> There's people on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the spectrum, taking things out of context. When really, if you'll just let the word of God discern itself, if you'll, if you'll balance the word of God for what it says, instead of trying to turn certain things towards your favor to live the life that you want to live. Just let the word guide you and rule your life. Amen? The closer that you become with the Lord and feel his heart, the more alienated you will feel in this world. And listen, my, my, um, <coughs> my point in this message is not to condemn anybody. If, if you're in here and you're like, man, I feel horrible because, you know, I have become too comfortable in this life. I have become too... Close and associated with things in this world. I, you know, I've I've kind of forgotten a little bit where my home lies, and I've just become too comfortable in this world with the world's things. My my intent is not to condemn you, but rather to wake you up. Amen. Don't forget where you live. Don't forget where your home is. This is not your home. Amen. Amen. Amen? Praise the Lord. Uh, so the closer you become to the Lord, the more and, and feel His heart, the more alienated you will feel. Uh, in this world. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 19. It says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That I mean, just chew on that for a little bit. Just think about that. That tells you that this life, we, we should not be content with just this world. You know, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he says, Everything under the sun. Somebody say everything. Everything. Everything is vanity. It's all vanity. Yes. So you build a big empire and you make a lot of money and you own a lot of houses and you own a lot of cars only to die and your children squander all the wealth that you accumulated. Yes. That's what he says. <laughs> you know, um, everything under the sun is vanity. What are you living for? Remember where your home is. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's go over here to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. You know why I'm so content in this life? Do you know why I'm so excited? It's because I choose to be all about God's will. He who does the will of God will abide forever. I'm not living for the lust of my flesh. I'm not living to have a good time. Although I love having good times. But I'm not living for that. Amen? I, I, I don't... I, you know, the source of my contentment is not um, how much money I have. The source of my contentment is not many, how many vacations I'm taking. The source of my contentment is not how many people love me, how many people like my status on Facebook. That, that's not the source of my contentment. The source of my contentment is, am I doing God's will? Amen. And the moment that I feel like I'm not in God's will, that's the moment that my contentment stops. Because it is all about his will. Why does my mind think like that? Because I realize that the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all that stuff that the world focuses on their entire life, invests all their energy in their entire life, it's all passing away. It's all passing away. My home is not here. In the temporary things that pass away, my home is with the Lord. Amen? And I am concerned about doing his will. Because I know there's coming a time very shortly. You know, I just laid my grandmother to rest. I'll tell y'all, you're going to hit, 
you know, 70, 80, 90 before you know it. I'm only 28 and I'm saying that. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, time flies, you know? And um, it's a shame that we should live for something so below. God, God has so much more for you than what is in this world. So much more. And it's time we get heavenly minded and recognize where our home is. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23. For I am hard pressed, Paul says, between the two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. He was struggling. Paul was struggling. He says, I want to go to be with the Lord. But the reason he chose to stay here was because he said, God's not done with me yet. God still wants to use me to minister to churches, to minister to Christians. But Paul said, to go be with the Lord is far better. Amen? Praise God. Don't get too comfortable down here. And just like Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 8, like we read at the beginning, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that as Christians, we should feel like we never quite belong. We don't belong down here. We don't belong up there. We're just, we're passing through. Amen? Amen. We're passing through. Um, <clears throat> I want us to look, let's go to the back to Matthew chapter 8. And I'm not going to read these scriptures, but you can check them out later uh, when you go home. I don't want to take up too much time here. But, so we stop in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 22. <clears throat> And, uh, but the message doesn't stop there. It continues on. And when you read from verses 23 all the way through chapter 9, really, uh, this is what we see. This is interesting here. Right after Jesus said, look, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There's nowhere in this life uh, in this world that the Son of Man belongs. And, and, and listen. Uh, this is what happened right after that. Jesus rebuked his disciples for being afraid of dying. Um, a whole city kicked Jesus out of their town when he cast out demons. You'd think that they'd be thankful that Jesus cast out the demons. No, they kicked him out of their town. Please leave us. That's what, that's, that was their response. Please leave us. Um, religious people got all upset about the way that Jesus killed a paralyzed man. Forget the fact that he healed a paralyzed man. No, it's the way he did it. Religious people got all upset. And they also got upset when Jesus sat down with sinners for a meal. Uh, Jesus got ridiculed for trying to lift up the faith of others. When someone was dead, he, he told them, don't be afraid, they're not dead, they're just they're sleeping. And they, they mocked him, they ridiculed him. He was trying to lift up their faith. That's what he was trying to do. And you know what Jesus had to do in order to heal that person? He had to, he had to take that person and, and, their, and their family to a separate room and minister to them there. He had to kick everyone out. <coughs> because they were choosing to be full of doubt and not lifted up in faith. Uh, Jesus was accused of being demon-possessed. That's a funny one, isn't it? When he healed a mute man, he was accused of being demon-possessed. You know, the truth of the matter is, when Jesus said... Foxes have holes and the birds of the birds of the air have nests, and then all this stuff starts coming on, and Jesus is being criticized, and all this crazy stuff is happening. You know, you can't please as a Christian who's following God, and I mean following God and living in the grace of God. Guess what? You're going to have enemies on the worldly side, and you're going to have enemies on the religious side. Yes. Some of the people when you're serving God in His grace, some of the people who are going to come against you the most are those who are religious. Listen, you have, you have no home here. The worldly people are against you because you stand up for what's right. And religious people are against you because, you know, you don't do everything the way they think you should do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You say, well, who do we have? Each other. <laughs> we have each other. Amen. Amen. And that's enough. And we have the Lord. Um, let's go to Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10, 25. They're fine, okay? It's towards the end. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So what, what is the, one of the great things he encourages us to do? When you get together, exhort one another, encourage one another. Why? Because it gets tough in this world, right? You have worldly people criticizing you and hating on you, and then you also have religious people criticizing you and hating on you. So we need encouragement. That's why he says come together, assemble together. Don't forsake that. Don't forsake one another. Listen, to look at your neighbor you're, and, and just think this to yourself. You're all I've got. <laughs> Amen? You're all I've got. Praise God. That's why God calls us the body of Christ, the family of Christ. Amen? Amen? Now let's go over here to Romans chapter 12, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up here in a second. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. The Lord says, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. So in other words, stop living for yourself and lay your life down so God can live through you. I beseech you, I'm sorry, here we go. Do not be conformed to this. There we go. I, <laughs> going back and forth there. All right. That's good. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Remember, apart from God's will, our lives mean nothing, right? Because he who does the will of God abides forever. Everything in this world is temporary. And so everything's going to pass away. Everything here in this world uh, is vanity. But he who does the will of God will last forever. And guess how you get to the will of God? You've got to let go of yourself. You've got to lay your life down and become a living sacrifice for the Lord. Uh, it's not that you become nothing. It's just that you surrender to God and allow him to take control Amen. of your life. And it says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. In other words, be set apart, right? In order that you may uh, prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will so that you can actually step into what God has for you. Amen? Amen? So you got to recognize where your home is. Let's go over here to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14, and then we'll wrap it up right here. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Amen. So you guys know the Wizard of Oz movie, right? <laughs> Follow the yellow brick road, okay? Why, did, why, did she, why was she supposed to stay on the yellow brick road? So she could get home. So she could find her way home. Right? Find the Wizard of Oz and get home. He could help her get home. I'm telling y'all, we need to stay on that narrow path that God has for us. There's, it's easy to get off that narrow path. It's, there's a lot of things Satan is going to tempt you with. There's a lot of distractions that are going to come along the way. There's a lot of opposition that's going to come along the way. Just like with Dorothy on her way to the Wizard of Oz. There's going to be a lot of opposition. Amen? There's going to be, you know, just like Dorothy dealt with a lot of flying monkeys and stuff like that. <laughs> Listen, there's going to be some flying monkeys in your life coming right at you. <laughs> and you, you've already experienced some flying monkeys. And some what I always call flying monkeys is crazy people, okay? <laughs> some crazy people just coming at you, you know, and, and just trying to... Just ruin your life, just tear your marriage apart, or just try to, I mean, you know, just, just try to bring you down, essentially. And you've got to be aware of that, but stay on the narrow path that God has you on. And I'll tell you, you know, this may sound a little corny to you, but this is very true. Um, you know, just like how Dorothy, she met, who was it, the, the scarecrow, right, who didn't have a brain. She met the cowardly lion, and she met the tin man who didn't have a heart, Right? And I'm telling you that if you'll stay on that narrow path that God has for you, that God will use you to touch people along the way. Uh, just like the scarecrow didn't have the brain, and, and God used Dorothy. Not God used Dorothy. What am I saying? And, and Dorothy, <laughs> the story, you know, and, and Dorothy helped out the scarecrow. God is going to use you to impart wisdom into people's lives along the way. Amen. Just like <laughs> God didn't use Dorothy. Look at that straight. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, right? I don't know. He could have used Dorothy. Maybe Dorothy was a Christian. Maybe we just didn't know that the whole time. Dorothy was a Christian. But um, <laughs> so God will use you to impart wisdom to other people. 
in the same in the same way that Dorothy helped out the scarecrow, in the same way that Dorothy helped out the cowardly lion. Guess what? God's going to use you to instill confidence in other people. Because there's some, there's a lot of people who have lost their way. Even your brothers and sisters, they've lost their way. They've lost their confidence. They don't think God loves them. They've lost their confidence that God still has a plan for them. And God is going to use you to minister to them along the way. But guess what? You'll never beat them if you don't stay on that narrow path that God has for you. Some of us are going our own way. We're taking the broad way. And we're saying, God... Show me what your will is. What do you have for me? Well, first of all, you've got to get on the narrow path. You've got to empty yourself, become a living sacrifice, and, and be separate from the world. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? Amen. And God is also, in the same way that Dorothy um, helped out the ten men, God is going to use you to impart his love to people. The Bible says in the last days, the love of many is going to grow cold. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of Christians out there who have been hurt, they've been abused, and their love has grown cold. Yeah. And God wants to use you to come up next to them and show them what true love is. Yeah. Remind them of their first love, and that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Some people have had such a hard time in life, traumatic experiences, they don't know what what love feels like. And some of them it's because they have heard people tell them that they love them and that same person told them they love them has hurt them tremendously. And so what happens is, is they close off their heart to love. They harden their heart to love. And God's calling you to come along and set them free and soften them up with his love. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up this morning. Praise God. You know, the most, beautiful, the most beautiful thing that could ever happen in this life is to give your life to Jesus Christ. To surrender to his love. I'll tell you, forgiveness is not hard. Redemption is not hard. Jesus did the hard work. All you have to do is say, yes, I believe with all of my heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and confess that he died for your sins so that you can be saved and, and, and live with him forever. It's simple. Amen? Amen? And so if you're here today or if you're watching online, you don't know Jesus, you can know Jesus right now. And whether you want to give your life to God for the first time or whether you want to rededicate yourself because you forgot where your home was, I'll tell you, God loves you the same now as he did when you were serving him fervently. His love for you has not wavered. Amen? So if you want to give your life to the Lord, I want you to repeat this after me and say, Father God, I love you because you first loved me. I give my life to you. I surrender to you. And I thank you for forgiving me, redeeming me, and making me new. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's praise God for a minute. We thank you, Father, for your life-giving power, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for calling us all by name. In Jesus' name. We thank you that you have the hairs on our head numbered. In Jesus' name, God. We are so grateful and thankful for your love that has called us out of this world into your marvelous grace. It's marvelous, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would show us once again the power of your grace, that we may marvel at who you are, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Do you guys know that song? As I was praying, um, do you guys know that song? I give myself away so you can lose me. I give myself away. Thank you, Lord. We give ourselves away so you can use us. Give ourselves away. Thank you, Father. Father, we give ourselves away to you this morning. We thank you for loving us and calling us. In Jesus' name. Father, you told us, Lord, that we would find life when we lose it. And we give ourselves away to you. 
We're not going to try to find ourselves anymore. We're going to give ourselves away. And I thank you that we are going to truly discover who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Be blessed as you go today. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. If you gave your life to the Lord, I want you to see Sister Sandra here in the front. Or if you need any kind of prayer, see Sister Sandra as well. She'll pray with you, get you fixed up. Amen. By faith. And uh, send on your way. God bless you. all have a wonderful day.